Welcome to the Bothell City Council meeting of February 6, 2018. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, all council members are here. Uh, meeting agenda approval. Is there any changes to tonight's meeting agenda? Deputy Mayor. I'd like to pull AB 18017 from consent. Okay. Is there any other changes to tonight's agenda? Oh, I've got an outdated agenda, but the, hold on just one second. Let me make sure. Okay, I'm good. Any other changes? How about the projected agenda? Any changes to the projected agenda? Everybody's happy. Okay, so moving on to uh, review of public engagement opportunities. Uh, first one is help us name our newest park. We are taking submissions to rename the Wayne Golf Course now through February 28th. Visit our website for more information. Uh, visit City Hall February 5th through February, or I'm sorry, April 20th to view award-winning illustrator and Bothell resident Dennis Wunch's work as we kick off the Bothell Arts and Festivals Commission's first annual City Hall Gallery Exhibition. Uh, last is Coffee with the Cop, Thursday, February 15th from 9 to 10.30 a.m. at Starbucks at 18404 120th Avenue Northeast. And next on our agenda is special presentations. So the first one we have is uh, the North Shore Senior Center update and we have Brooke Knight, who's the CEO. Good evening. Thank you so much for hosting me here tonight. My name is Brooke Knight and I'm the new-ish CEO of the North Shore Senior Center. I've been there for about five months. So I'm happy to be here. Um, we have um, been an organization going through a lot of change over the last several years and I'm proud to say that we are, we are moving forward um, and on pace to do some exciting things in 2018. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank the City of Bothell and all of you as elected officials for the ongoing support that you've provided to the Senior Center over the years. In 2017 alone, your support allowed us to serve just under 6,000 individuals, 63% of whom were low income. And of those 6,000, about 1,800 were residents of the City of Bothell. So, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what impact our services had on each of those individuals specifically. Um, many of you may know a little bit about what the North Shore Senior Center does, but um, I'm gonna give you a little overview just in case. Um, we are actually the second largest senior center in the United States. And oftentimes when you think of a senior center, you think of a place where people go and play cards and, and have some recreation and some social activities. And we definitely do that, but we really pride ourselves on doing a lot more than that. Um, we provide very holistic, comprehensive services to older adults in our community. We also provide those services to disabled adults of all ages and to family caregivers. So the people who are at home taking care of older adults and um, disabled adults and provide services to all three of those groups. Um, we also are really proud of the fact that we've helped to um, really develop and implement a number of evidence-based practices here at the North Shore Senior Center that have become national models for providing care to older adults and disabled adults. Um, and by evidence-based, what I really mean is a program that evidence has demonstrated is actually having a positive impact on these individuals. So that's something that we are as I said, very proud of and hoping to do more of in the future, um, really demonstrating an impact in, in our day-to-day -day work. Um, we have, as part of the North Shore Senior Center, we have four locations. Um, we have our two centers here right across the river, um, the North Shore Senior Center, the Senior Center itself, and right next to it, the Adult Day Health Center. We also have a Senior Center in Mill Creek and one in Kenmore. And um, the three senior centers really focus on providing that recreation type activity. Um, you can go there and be in a card club, you can do a craft group, you can take classes, um, learn how to paint, you can be in the ski club. Um, a lot of you are probably familiar with our pickleball, which has become quite the, um, the 
rage um, in the community. Um, you can get a loan for medical equipment. So if you're having surgery and you might need a wheelchair for a couple of months, um, rather than purchasing one, you can come by and um, pick up a wheelchair. So we do a lot of different kind of social, recreational, educational type activities there, as well as some support groups. Um, Additionally, we have a fitness center over there where we're working with individuals uh, with a variety of different needs, but really specialize um, in serving people who maybe have had surgery recently and maybe near, um, have just exhausted their um, physical therapy benefit, medical benefit, so they can come to us and get that same type of specialized uh, support that they would receive from a physical therapist at a, a tremendously reduced rate. Um, so they're getting um, the type of care that they need without having to pay out of pocket in that same way, which has been tremendously beneficial to people. And then we have a full suite of social services that we offer. So through the Senior Center, we have a nurse on staff, we have a social worker. I'm really thrilled to tell you tonight that we've just received funding for a new mental health professional that we're in the process of hiring. Um, and we do a number of different programs for individuals um, through those, uh, those highly trained clinical staff. So we do depression management programs, um, slip and fall programs, um, disease prevention programs, programs, um, so we're really working to provide very comprehensive holistic support to people to take care of their, um, their comprehensive well-being. We have an employment program where we focus on matching people who may have a skill, like a plumber, for example, who may be retired but still wanting to make a little bit of income with people who may have a need for that skill but may not be able to afford the full price of hiring a plumber. And so we do background checks on individuals and match them, um, and it's really a win-win for people um, who have those needs in our community and can't afford um, the full price for those services. We have a fleet of 16 buses that we provide transportation services to, and this is uh, paratransit, so we're able to transport wheelchairs. Um, we are one of the few transportation services that actually can cross the county line, which you can imagine in the city of Bothell is incredibly important. Um, and we are um, able to provide transportation to people, not just to medical appointments, but really to take them grocery shopping, to take them to visit their their friend to take them to the senior center, really to increase their mobility um, in whatever way is needed to help um, ensure that they have an enriching, fulfilled life. So that's been incredibly beneficial to the individuals who use those services. And then, um, as I mentioned, we have a second facility across the foot footbridge from the Senior Center, which is our adult day health facility. And that's where we're really providing comprehensive clinical services to people who have disabilities, and, and really two types of disabilities. So we're working with older adults who um, may have Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, dementia, uh, traumatic brain injury, um, have had a stroke, working on either improving their their um, independence and making sure that they're, they still have those skills to remain independent and vital, or really slowing the progression of the disease oftentimes is what we're working with if it's something like dementia or Alzheimer's. Um, and while those individuals are enrolled in that program, which could be up to five days a week for five hours a day, we're giving um, the caregiver that um, needed respite and support. So they have uh, support groups, one-on-one uh, -on -one support that they can participate in, or they can just go and do whatever they need to do knowing that their loved one is in good hands and receiving the care that they need. And then the other group that we're working with um, at that facility is young adults who have cognitive disabilities. Um, that's what we call our inclusion program. It's often been referred to as our Wranglers program or a Wranglers team. You may be aware of it in that term. Um, and we're working again with young people who um, are really looking to become more independent um, and so making sure that they have the skills that they might need to um, live independently, to have a job in the community, um, and to live just fulfilling enriched lives. We partner with Special Olympics. Um, we do a lot of recreation with those young people, some music therapy, some art therapy, um, really to make sure that they do have enriched fulfilled lives and that's really the mission of what we are trying to do overall as an organization. 
at what I'm sure will come as no surprise to you is that our community is continuing to age. It's also continuing to become more diverse. And um, as our community ages, we see an increase in the number of diseases related to aging, whether it's Alzheimer's or dementia. Um, those The prevalence of those diseases in, is increasing rapidly. Um, so we know that the need for our type of services is going to continue to, to grow. Um, we want to be in a position where we are able to um, really ensure that everyone walking through our doors is getting their full set of needs met by us. Um, and we want to make sure that we are also accessible to everyone in our community who has the needs um, that we might be able to help with. And so those are kind of our two priorities as we move forward, both making sure that we have comprehensive services in-house to meet the needs that we're seeing and, or that we're seeing grow, and that we are um, really uh, setting ourselves up to serve the, the diverse breadth of our community and um, making sure that people can access us when needed, whether that's through our language capacity, whether it's through the transportation services that we offer, whether it's through the hours that we're open, making sure that we are highly accessible to everyone walking through our door. So in closing, I just want to share one little brief story of um, how I've seen our, our senior center impact um, people in this community. Um, there was a woman uh, about a year ago who had been the caregiver to her husband who was um, suffering with Alzheimer's. And unfortunately for both of them, she, uh, she was not engaged in or aware of our programs um, at the time. Um, she had been the caregiver for her husband for many years, and as he declined, in health, um, she became really unable to leave the house. She she stayed um, by his side on on a daily basis and left the house really only to go get the mail every day. Um, and so when he passed away, she found herself really unable to care for herself as well. Um, she got connected with the senior center and started um, coming to a couple of our different um, programs and activities. Um, one of them that was really meaningful was um, she started going to our fitness center and participated with our trained staff there to really develop a plan for increasing her own ability to become independent, to um, start walking a little bit further, to be able to um, take care of herself in that way. Um, she is now one of the um, women that you will see in our fitness center who is lifting weights on a daily basis. She is incredibly strong and healthy and robust, and um, both by the that and the community that she has connected with at the Senior Center, her life has really made a 180 degree turn from what it was. Um, and so these are the types of, this is just one little snippet, but these are the types of impacts that we're having across our community every day where we're providing really tangible needs, um, benefit to people, but we're also creating a sense of community for individuals that helps them remain vibrant, healthy, and thriving um, into old age. Um, in a way that they might not have been without the services that we offer. So again, thank you so much for your ongoing support. Um, we couldn't do it without you. We are so grateful for all that the city of Bothell does for us, and um, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Uh, there's a couple questions or comments, I believe, from council. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Hi, thanks for presenting. Um, my mother belongs to the Senior Center, and she does everything there, pickleball, bike club, ski club, so I know um, you provide some really great outlet for uh, adults that have time and energy. Um, I did have a question regarding the annual fees. Are, what are they currently? The annual fee is $35 for an individual or uh, $60 for a couple. We do offer scholarships when people can't afford that. Okay, great, thank mm -hmm. you. Any other questions? Well, thank you. Oh, there we go, Councilor Olson. Uh, I just, very early in your uh, presentation, you were talking that you were the second largest in the US. I was just wondering if it's just the population you serve or square footage or what it's. That is by population. Now, this is this is a little bit unconfirmed. This is the story I've been told since I've started, so I haven't actually done the investigation. Um, the story is that the first largest, the largest senior center in the United States is also the North Shore Senior Center, but it is in Chicago. So, and it's just by total membership, total um, visitors to the center. 
Well, thank you for your service to the community. I think it's super important to keep their keep the elderly's minds working. My mom lives at home alone, and I worry about her a little bit because she doesn't go to a senior center. So, I think you just encouraged me to encourage her. Send her by. All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right, uh, next on the agenda is the Snohomish County Health District update, and we have Jeff Ketchell, the administrator here, to give a presentation. Thank you, Mayor, uh, good evening. I also wanna introduce uh, Dr. Mark Beatty, our brand new uh, health officer, the health officer for Snohomish County, and uh, he'll be joining me in the presentation this evening. So first and foremost, uh, I just wanna say thank you to the Bothell City Council for uh, Councilman Liam Olson, uh, our newest member of the Board of Health. He has jumped in with both feet. Uh, he came and spent some time with me before uh, our administrative committee meeting the other day and got a tour of the building. And he's, he is now an expert on everything Snohomish Health District. And uh, I gave him uh, plenty of reading material, so I'm gonna begin the quiz on everything I sent him to read. The question number one, I'm kidding. Uh, second of all, uh, uh, thank you very much to uh, the City of Bothell for your continued support and increased contribution to the Snohomish Health District. Uh, some of the things that we're going to talk about tonight, some of the work that we're doing is critically connected to the funding we're receiving uh, from the cities, from the county, from the state, this flexible funding that allows us to really uh, be able to move quickly and move dynamically and respond to the things going on in Snohomish County. Uh, last time I was here last summer, uh, I was very fresh as a, an interim administrator for the health district and uh, a lot of changes over the past six months, one of which is now I am now the permanent administrator, so you are stuck with me for the foreseeable future. Uh, I'm thankful for that. Uh, but beyond the leadership changes and the addition of Dr. Beatty, uh, one of the issues at hand was the disposition of the Rucker Building where the Snowmers Health District is located in Everett. Uh, the building is currently in process being sold to the city of Everett and we're in the, currently in the process of buying um, a pair of buildings owned by Volunteers of America over by Angels of the Wind Casino Arena, which is the Xfinity Arena, I'm getting used to saying that. Uh, staying in that downtown uh, Everett core near the county campus is our, one of our top priorities because we do a lot of business with the county, and so uh, we're looking to stay in that area. Uh, another issue at hand uh, last summer was whether or not the health district would merge with Snohomish County government. Uh, that issue has been put to rest for now, uh, and the Board of Health unanimously passed a resolution uh, supporting that the health district remain independent. Um, in that report, though, that discussed whether or not the health district should join the county done by former county council member uh, Gossett, one of the things he, he discussed was uh, some of the issues at hand, including the health district, lacking uh, mission clarity. And so when somebody says your agency lacks mission clarity, I take that very seriously. And so as the new administrator, uh, that's something we went to work on. And the title of our, of our new mission, the one that we're currently pursuing is called Chief Health Strategist. That's a term I want you to become familiar with. It's a, it's a term used amongst public health professionals around the state and the country. In fact, I was just down in Olympia all day today meeting with the state health department and my uh, other local health, pub, local public health leaders uh, working on how we're applying this, this chief health strategist idea to our, to our, to our work. I'm gonna give some, uh, some of the categories of what it means to be chief health strategist and how the Snohomish Health District is working to meet those. First of all, we have to be able to adopt and adapt to no matter what is going on in our community, no matter what's causing premature death, illness, or injury. Um, just like a lot of governments, our, most of our funding is very categorical in nature. So we, you know, we get federal dollars for emergency preparedness, we can only use that for emergency preparedness. We get money from the county to res prevent and respond to tuberculosis, we have to use that for tuberculosis. However, uh, how do we respond to things that are emerging or things that are not part of those funding streams like suicide? Uh, suicide's a very critical issue connected with mental health and depression in our, in our community. And we're seeing rates of depression and suicide rise in different groups and how are we responding to that? And where we funded a full-time position uh, in, in injury prevention uh, working on that issue. Another big one is opioids. And I'm gonna spend a couple minutes now talking about the very robust response that the Snohomish Health District is currently working on with opioids. Um, we're currently working to try to increase the amount of treatment available in Snohomish County in partnership with uh, uh, Snohomish County Human Services and others, and that's something Dr. Beatty is working on. Uh, we're also working with the City of Bothell on your opioid action plan with uh, Chief of Police and others, and we're very excited to be playing a role in that. Uh, 
We're also working on the, some of the collateral damage of this of this crisis, including um, waste syringes. And so the Snohomish Health District has put together 1,000 of these needle cleanup kits. Uh, we saw in the news, we saw moms and coaches going out to uh, playgrounds and parks to clean up syringes so their kids could safely play or practice out there. And so we thought, well, that's you know not okay and it's, it's potentially dangerous. So we put together these kits with tongs and some heavy duty gloves um, and a needle box for people to put needles in if they find them, if they're part of an organized cleanup or they just wanna go out to their park or their neighborhood or uh, the alley behind your business. Uh, we've distributed 650 of these kits so far and 10,000 syringes have come back to us. Um, and we're continuing to uh, improve that. And we're looking for other places to partner that, that want to distribute these uh, kits as well, and we will continue to uh, uh, put these together and distribute them. Uh, but if the city of Bothell would like to distribute them from your offices, uh, we'd be happy to partner with you on that. Another thing we're doing is trying to uh, make sure uh, people don't have access to opioids that they're not prescribed to them. And we've been handing out these uh, lockup bags at different community events around Snohomish County where somebody could uh, lock up their opioids to prevent their guest or teenager from accessing them when they shouldn't be. If uh, you have a bottle of oxycodone in your medicine cabinet, how do you know if somebody's not taking one or two of those pills? This will def if somebody wants to get into it, they definitely can, it's like a banker's bag, but this is, uh, it's got a nice combination or key lock on it and it helps uh, keep those protected. Or if you're traveling, uh, it's a nice uh, idea as well. Uh, we've also uh, launched a new website. Uh, you got the and uh, I'll hand out these magnets. Uh, we, hold, we helped host a number of opioid forums around Snohomish County uh, last, uh, year before last, and one of the consistent messages was there was no one-stop shopping for opioid information in Snohomish County. So we launched a website called SnohomishOverdosePrevention.com, and it's sort of a one-stop shop for everything, prevention, treatment, anything you might, with data, anything you want to find, and we're continuing to add new things to it all the time. Another issue that uh, we were asked about was what happens when uh, uh, police officers encounter uh, synthetic opioids out in the field and there might be a potential exposure. You may have read in the news that some officers in other parts of the country have been exposed and, and had to have had Narcan applied to them. Uh, we've put together uh, an operating procedure that if uh, police officers come across uh, manufacturing or storage of uh, potential drugs in an apartment or a hotel, uh, we now have a situation uh, a plan in place to respond to that, just like we used to do back in the 90s with meth labs. And so a lot of those same staff are still around and we have that level of expertise. And then especially like a hotel room, we wanna make sure it's safe for reoccupancy um, and somebody else is not gonna get exposed. Um, another part about being chief health strategist is data. And I'm gonna have Dr. Beatty come up and talk about some of the work we're doing with uh, uh, creating a more dynamic real-time data situation, especially with opioids. Let me just introduce myself. Um, so I'm the new health officer. My background is I worked for CDC for uh, in Atlanta for seven years um, and have a master's in public health from Johns Hopkins. I worked at the International Vaccine Institute in Korea for five years, um, improving access to vaccines in developing countries and then worked in the pharmaceutical industry on vaccines for five years, uh, finally coming back to the Northwest. I did my PEDS residency in OHSU. So happy to be here. I think it's a great county. I think as Jeff says, we are, we're a good size to be mobile, nimble, and not too big to get too complicated. So I think there's a great, a lot of great opportunities here. Um, in terms of what's going on with opioids, my plan to, the first, the, the issue is, is defining the problem. Everybody wants to know how big of a problem the opioid uh, issue is in this county, and it's a really hard number to get at because there's so many different facilities involved, and it went, and people don't don't always want to get treated. So how do you count people who are not in treatment? And so through my research and using CDC studies, it's actually possible to focus on opioid overdose deaths, collect data on that in an accurate way, and then add to that emergency um, room visits for overdoses that were not fatal and back calculate to estimate the total burden in the county, which is useful both to decide where and how many additional treatment um, slots are needed for the different kinds of treatment, which could include uh, methadone or uh, suboxone. 
Um, the good news is this is a 100% preventable and 100% treatable disease. We just need to be able to get services to the pe people who need them. So in addition to taking the data, I would then study, I, will, I am studying the landscape of what's available to figure out what the gaps are and how to get, how to facilitate getting patients from um, when they have an aha moment like they overdosed and survived, they had a baby that was addicted, or other types of events uh, to get into treatment right away. So treatment on demand is really the best way to go, um, but we have some, we have a ways to go to get there. And so all of this work that I'm doing is attempting to get to that information. We are on the verge of getting actually real-time data set up where as people are getting admitted to uh, hospitals, that data would be available and so that we could follow very closely the, the trends that are going on and what's happening with overdoses. And we want to not only provide assistance to getting people to treatment, but we also want to prevent the deaths and doing education and uh, prevention with active users is another important test that we're working on. So with that, uh, I mean, and I'm involved from top to bottom, in fact, so today I met with the medical examiners to talk about different ways that we might be able to better define the problem. Tomorrow I'm going out with the environmental health group to do some inspections on nuisance properties um, to get a better handle of how that works and where those locations are. So um, happy to be here and happy to answer questions. Jeff? All right. Uh, uh, we're also working on uh, sexually transmitted infections, another project. So when I was here last summer, that was a, a question that was asked. It was about uh, uh, drug-resistant gonorrhea. I'm not sure, if, I can't remember which council member asked that question. Raise your hand. Okay. Oh, it was you, I thought, I thought she was <laughs> going. Anyway, uh, I was gonna, I'm gonna let Dr. Beatty give an update on that. Sorry, I'm just gonna be up and down here. So, uh, I mean, the primary problem with uh, drug-resistant gonorrhea was the issue that, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, first of all, it's, it continuing to increase not only in this county, but in the state and um, across the country at a rate of about 12% increases in cases. We're seeing a return of neonatal syphilis, which is we haven't seen in years, which is just another marker of this STD problem getting out of control. In terms of resistant gonorrhea, there was a concern that um, it may be becoming resistant to oral um, cephalosporins. And so then everybody would have to get a shot rather than a pill alone. And sometimes that's a little bit more difficult to coordinate, especially with partners. But fortunately, the data that initially showed that in the following, the, the, the next year, um, it disappeared. And it may be back, but for the, we're on a, we have a respite for now. And we're still okay using, um, oral drugs, both um, azithromycin and suffixine to treat patients with STDs. So that's good news. Okay. Don't go anywhere. So uh, we've had 27 influenza deaths this year, and I was gonna have Dr. Beatty update you on uh, the influenza season. Okay. Um, so it's actually gone up, uh, I think it's around 35 now. This year has not, been as bad a, a year actually as last year. There was a lot of concerns that this could be an, another banner year, but basically for us in the county and in the state, this, the peak of the flu season has passed. So we're now on the downside of the, the flu season and within a, six to eight weeks, we'll be pretty much back to pre-flu numbers again. It's still important to avoid flu because the risk to any that any one person who gets flu could still have a severe complication like hospitalization or death is still possible but the good news is that the the possibility of overwhelming hospitals and other things has passed for this season and uh, things are improving this year has been similar to previous years um, maybe four I think a similar year would have been 2014 2015 flu season. So there was nothing particularly unusual about the year. It did start a little late, and that usually predicts it's not gonna be as bad a year, so that's good news as well. All right, that's good, thanks. Uh, um, another part of being a chief health strategist is being uh, 
having good uh, up-to-date modern business practices. And I will admit the Snohomish Health District uh, has fallen behind on a lot of our IT. But over the past six months, we've improved dramatically our um, infrastructure. Uh, we're currently in the process of updating our financial software, which was last updated in 1997. It looks like an MS-DOS program where you can't even use a mouse. You have to tab through the different fields. Uh, so we'll have a new system up this spring. We've also launched something called Envision Connect Online, or ECO. And now uh, customers in Stomish County can renew their permits, file complaints, submit new plans, monitor the, process, the progress of those plans, check uh, on the inspection records of your favorite restaurant, all kinds of things, and order birth certificates, and soon we'll be able to order death certificates as well, all from the comfort of their own home. And so uh, I read today in the paper that Everett has uh, the worst traffic in the country for a city of its size. And so now you don't have to come up to Everett. You can just do business from your computer. And I think uh, most of most restaurants this year renewed their permits uh, through our new online service. Uh, we're also looking at moving to a mobile office as part of our efficiency. Do our inspectors need to come into the building every day? Can they deploy directly from their homes? A lot of private industry and a lot of government agencies are doing this now, and this is something we want to add to our, our suite of efficiencies. Um, another part of being a chief health strategist is partnerships. Uh, so we're currently looking to partner with some schools about develop, uh, development and implementation of an opioid prevention curriculum, and North Shore Schools has expressed an interest in that, and we look forward to working with them down there. Uh, it's also being non-traditional in your partnerships. Uh, we've just partnered with 74 apartment complexes throughout the county on being smoke-free. And so now you can go to the Snohomish Health District website and find smoke-free apartments uh, uh, to uh, live in a, a healthier, safer environment. And then lastly, partnerships with city, places like the City of Bothell are absolutely critical if the Snohomish Health District is going to fulfill its mission of keeping us all healthier and safer. So thanks again for uh, your Board of Health participation. Thanks again for your funding. And Dr. Beatty and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, guys. Is there any uh, questions from the council? You want to show off all the stuff you know, Councilmember Olson? <laughs> Mayor. Yeah, all right. Deputy Mayor. I just want to thank you for bringing back the information um, that I had asked about earlier. And I'm, I'm really impressed with all your new initiatives. Um, thank you for everything. Thank you. A lot going on. We're not bored. <coughs> Councilmember McCullough. Thank you, and you did mention, and I think it's really important, that prevention starts with our young people in our schools. And that actually is what reduced the use of marijuana, reduced the use of alcohol, and that also is critically important to, to prevention for our young people. So I appreciate you doing that. Welcome. Um, we did see in Snohomish County schools amongst 12th graders from 2014 to 2016, the percent of those who had used heroin dropped from 5.7%, which seems obscenely high to me, down to, I believe, 3.2%. So even without not a lot of organized efforts, the schools have been working with to drop those numbers in schools, and we look to continue in 2018. Uh, when we uh, look at those numbers again, we hopefully will see a uh, continued re reduction. Well, thank you for coming in. It sounds like the Snohomish County Health District's on a uh, good trajectory. Uh, a couple years ago, it was a little scary there for you guys. <laughs> At least it looked like it from our end. But tell me about it. Yeah. I'm, glad, I'm glad it's uh, everything's on the up and up. So thank you, Mayor. Yep. See, right. We'll see you soon. All right. Have a good night. Uh, next, we have a staff briefing by Mr. Sherman uh, the, on the finance software called Munis. Good evening, Mayor, uh, Council Members. Uh, tonight I've asked uh, Lisa Rossiter, our System Supervisor, and David Bickle, our Application Analyst and Project Manager, uh, to give you a brief update on the financial software, Munis, uh, and how the implementation is going. So I'll have them come up. Good evening. So we wanted to briefly update you on the upgrade of our financial system. This was a council approved project in January of 2017. We kicked off the project shortly thereafter. 
Um, we updated our, are in the process of updating our aging financial system, which included financials, utility billing, uh, payroll, and uh, human resources. This supports one of the council's primary goals of a citywide technology strategy. Um, through this project, we're uh, implementing an enterprise-wide solution, which is something we're strategically trying to do uh, in an ongoing effort. Uh, we created staff efficiencies and are continuing to do that through the project. We're introducing some citizen convenience tools and promoting citizen transparency and some straightforward reporting through this project. Um, it's a three-year project starting in 2017 and wrapping up in 2019. And of course, with this new application, we'll be updating financials, utility billing, HR, and payroll. Phase one is actually completed, and David is going to tell us about phase one. So uh, our financial system went live on January 2nd. Um, it was a, a major milestone for us and affected the uh, entire organization. Um, the implementation was performed by a team of 11 uh, members throughout uh, finance, city clerk, public works, and IS. It took about 9,000 hours to implement, uh, which we were able to do with no downtime for the organization and zero impact to citizen services. Um, some highlights of the system include improved reporting, uh, tightly controlled contract spending through system automation, improved budget planning uh, with an easy interface, paper-free reporting, backup documentation, and invoice storage. So this is effectively a, a paper-free system. So now that we have phase one completed, where do we go from here? Phase one was huge. It was a major accomplishment and it went very well. Um, but we still have a lot of work to do. So phase two is next, which is very exciting. Phase two is utilities. One of the things we're gonna be implementing is citizen online bill pay. Um, that comes in November of 2018. A couple of features that are gonna come with that is billing history for customers as data built. They'll be able to monitor that and they'll also be able to opt out of paper bills. Also in 2018, we'll be in implementing the human resources product selection and contract. Then in 2019, we'll move on to phase three. Here we'll implement payroll and human resources. We'll also move on to timekeeping and citizen transparency. Citizen transparency, as more data builds in the system, will give us the ability to present financial data imp uh, information to citizenry in a, in a browser with a little, little, uh, little effort on our part or the citizens' part. I just wanted to give a big thanks to the uh, phase one core project team. Uh, they gave uh, a, a strong effort, a fantastic collection of very smart, very hardworking people, all experts in their field. So I'll just give a, a huge thanks to them for their positive attitude throughout the whole project. So I think we have Mo here anyway, so <laughs> thanks Mo. And um, yeah, open up uh, for any questions. Great, thank you. Is there questions from council? Well, <clears throat> to have zero downtime is a rather staggering number, and I just wanted to thank all of you guys for doing a fantastic job on the on the software system uh, imp implementation. <clears throat> One of the things that I think I've been uh, harassed about the most as the, the mayor is that you cannot pay your bills online, um, and so it's I'm really glad that's gonna happen before I'm done being <laughs> up here. Um, know, technology is not necessarily an exciting thing, but we're really excited about this financial system upgrade oh, yeah. and that in particular. Yeah, and I look forward to the, the uh, what I think you call them transparency tools or whatever, so people can actually get, you know, get a little more acquainted to our budget documents instead of reading a couple hundred pages of a um, PDF. So that'll be fun. I look forward to it. Nobody else is. Anybody else want to say something? There we go, Deputy Mayor. I'll say something. No one will be happier about the bill pay than my husband. <laughs> so thank you very much. And uh, kudos for a job well done. Thank you. All right, and that's it. No. We got it. Thank you thank for you. coming in. Uh, let's see here. Executive session. So we have a potential litigation matter pursuant to RCW 4230-110-1I, and we need 45 minutes? Huh. Okay, so we're gonna go into executive session for 45 minutes, and we will be back at, what does that put us at? 720.